Welcome back to Advanced Concepts. We're going to spend some time talking about elimination and we're going to start by talking about the renal or urinary system. We're going to do um, a brief anatomy and physiology review starting with the kidneys. Uh, there's normally two kidneys located in the peritoneum. Each There is one that sits on either side of the spine. Uh, the adult kidney is typically four to five inches long, two to three inches wide and about an inch thick. The left kidney is slightly longer and narrower than the right. If there is variation in kidney shape and number, it's really not uncommon and it doesn't necessarily mean that there's a problem. So we need to look more at diagnostic testings when we are concerned about uh, the decrease or lack of kidney function. There are several layers of tissue that surround the kidney and provide protection and support. Uh, the outer surface is the capsule. Um, lying beneath the renal capsule there's two layers of kidney tissue called the renal cortex as well as the medulla. Um, the cortex is the outer tissue layer that is covered by the renal capsule and the medulla is the um, inner area that is shaped much like fans and each fan is called a pyramid and each kidney has 12 to 18 pyramids. The renal columns are cortical tissue that dips down into the interior of the kidney and then separates the pyramid. So you can see that information kind of in this pictorial view um, off to the right. It's also figure 68-2 in your text. The kidneys do have a rich blood supply and receive 20 to 25 percent of total cardiac output and the blood flow to the kidneys varies from 600 to 1300 milliliters per minute. Um, the venous blood from the kidneys starts with capillaries surrounding each nephron and the capillaries drain into progressively larger veins with blood eventually being returned to the inferior vena cava through the renal vein. When you're looking at microscopic wise, we need to talk a little bit about the nephron. Uh, the nephron is the working or functional unit of the kidney and it's where urine is actually formed from blood. Typically each kidney has about a million nephrons and each nephron separately makes urine from the blood. Um, bl the blood supply to the nephron is delivered through, afferent, through the afferent arteriole, which is the smallest, most distal portion of renal, the renal ar arterial system. From the afferent arteriole, blood flows into the glomerulus, which the glomerulus, remember, is a series of specialized capillary loops. And it's through these capillaries that water and small particles are filtered from blood to make urine. The remaining blood leaves through the glomerulus through the efferent arteriole, which is the first vessel in the venous system of the kidney. Each nephron is a tube-like structure with distinct parts, and the tube begins at Bowman's capsule, which you will see pointed out up here on this picture. This is also figure 68-3 of your text. Um, the tubular tissue of Bowman's capsule narrows into the proximal convoluted tubule and that tubule twists and finally straightens into the descending loop of Henle, which is right down here at the bottom of that photo. The descending loop of Henle dips into the, in the direction of the medulla but forms a hairpin loop and then comes back up into the cortex as the ascending loop of Henle. There are two segments of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. The, um, there's a thin and thick segment. The distal convoluted tubule forms from the thick segment of the ascending limb of the loop of Henle and ends in one of the many collecting ducts located in the kidney tissue. There are special cells in the afferent arteriole, efferent arteriole, and the distal convoluted tubule known as juxtaglomular um, complexes, and these specialized cells produce and store renin. So you need to reflect back to the renin angiotensin um, aldosterone cycle. Renin, remember, is that hormone that helps regulate blood flow, glomerular filtration, and blood pressure. Um, when you think about other hormones that are going to be important, aldosterone um, is important. Aldosterone increases kidney resorption of uh, sodium and water that helps restore blood pressure, blood volume, and blood sodium levels. So when we talk about the juxtaglomular complex, you can see um, in this photo where the renin-producing granular cells are, um, where they're located on the afferent and efferent arteriole. 
Considering the um, kidneys and the functions of the kidneys, um, the kidney is responsible for um, helping maintain fluid, electrolyte, and acid-base balance. It's done by glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. So you need to think about the terms filtration, diffusion, active transport, and osmosis. When we are thinking about glomerular filtration rates, or GFR, that's going to be controlled by blood pressure and blood flow, and it allows the kidneys to self-regulate renal blood pressure and renal blood flow. It's controlled by selectively constricting and dilating the afferent and efferent arterioles. Um, typically, the tubules return about 99% of all filtered water back into the body. Um, most water reabsorption occurs as the filtrate passes through the um, posterior collecting tubule. Or I'm sorry, the proximal convoluted tubule. The distal convoluted tubule can be very permeable to water and some water reabsorption can occur as the filtrates continue to flow through that tubule. As far as hormonal functions, um, the kidneys produce the renin, prostaglandins, bradykinin, erythropoietin, and activated vitamin D. And remember the activated vitamin D is going to be responsible for, um, the, um, for the body to absorb calcium. Um, I talked a little bit about renin. Um, prostaglandins are produced in the kidneys, um, specifically prostaglandin E2 and prostacyclin um, PGI1. And these are just going to help regulate glomerular filtration, kidney vascular resistance, and then renin production. We talked about bradykinin, bradykinin in basic concepts, and bradykinin is produced in response to the presence of angiotensin II. Uh, erythropoietin is produced and released in response to decreased oxygen tension in the kidney blood supply. It helps trigger red blood cell production in the bone marrow. And then vitamin D um, is utilized to convert um, vitamin D into its active form um, where it's needed to absorb calcium in the, in the intestinal tract. So as we continue down the, urina the urinary system, the ureters, each kidney has a single ureter, which is a hollow tube that connects um, the renal pelvis with the uh, urinary bladder. The ureter is about a half inch in diameter and about 12 to 18 inches in length. The ureter has three layers, so an inner lining of mucus, a middle layer of smooth muscle, and an outer layer of fibrous tissues. Uh, contractions of the smooth muscle in the ureter move urine from the renal pelvis of the kidney into the bladder. And then finally, the bladder is a muscular sac. Um, it's composed of a body and the bladder neck. And again, the bladder has three linings, um, an inner lining of epithelial cells, a middle layer of smooth muscle, and an outer lining. Um, that helps support and allow its functionality. Um, the bladder is a temporary urine storage site and provides continence and enables voiding. So we're going to spend some time talking about continence and incontinence and continence being the ability to voluntarily control bladder emptying. Um, so we will talk about um, urination and um, difficulties with incontinence. Lastly, the, the urethra is the narrow tube lined with mucous membranes and epithelial cells and the urethral meatus is the opening um, and is the end point of the urethra. Um, in men, the urethra is about six to eight inches long and located at the tip of the, uh, the tip of the penis. And in women, the urethra is about an inch to an inch and a half long and exits the bladder through the pelvic floor and lies slightly below the th clitoris and directly in front of the vagina and rectum. So with the urethra, um, we need to think about keeping, you know, when you're doing sterile procedures such as inserting it fully catheters or doing in and out catheters, things like that, we want to make sure that we keep that a sterile environment um, so that we don't um, introduce any bacteria into our patients. So basically, Basically, that is the anatomy and physiology review. Please come to class ready to talk about the exemplars that are listed out on your detailed student syllabus.